Sylvia. I'm one of the fellows in child psychiatry, in case some of you don't know me. And I'm here to introduce Bridget Ruiz. She's going to be talking today about substance abuse in adolescence. And she is an associate research professor at the University of Arizona at the Southwest Institute for Research on Women. And they have some campuses or sites on campus, and she's actually off campus at a near Tucson and Broadway location. She has no conflicts of interest uh, to disclose for today's lecture. And after looking through her CV, she's got tons of publications and presentations. I think I counted over 100, or close to 100 presentations. Um, but some of, some of it is on, it's all related to substance abuse, but she's been involved with cultural factors, gender factors, trauma. Um, she's done research with drug court uh, downtown at the detention center and with Seven Challenges, which is a, a rehab program for teens in the city. And she's also worked on some treatment manuals. So uh, welcome, Bridget. With, and the title of her talk is Teens 2.0, Hardware, Software, and Recovery Considerations Related to Illicit Drug Use. Thank you, everyone. Um, I have a tendency to be a little height challenge. So is every, can everybody see me above the podium? OK, good. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Beauvais and Dr. Guman, for um, inviting me here today to talk about a subject that I really enjoy talking about. Um, and that's about teenagers and substance abuse. Um, as Dr. Beauvais mentioned, I've been doing this work for probably about, I've been with the university for 11 years and uh, affiliated with the Southwest Institute for Research on Women and our work primarily is in applied research. We're out testing interventions, evaluating interventions, particularly for women and children. And my area of expertise happens to be with teens. Teens are kind of my, the, the population that I enjoy working with the most. Um, I do want to make just a couple of uh, announcements. There are some materials over here from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, these, I only have about 25, um, but please feel free to take them. But at the end, I can also give you a website of where to get this information. It's absolutely free. You can, there's other materials that you can get from NIDA, um, and they're really kind of handy for teaching or um, with in, within your classes or papers or those types of things. Um, so there was a question, what did Teens 2.0 mean? And t Teens 2.0 is if we look at the web evolution, we now have the, the internet 2.0, so I think we've also have evolved involving teenagers that are teens 2.0, and and we're going to talk about the hardware, software, and recovery considerations. Okay, so where am I going in the next hour? Um, first, I'm going to just review some definitions. Some of this information will be very familiar, and perhaps just review for everyone. Um, then I'm going to talk about how these definitions apply. Um, to some of the ba recent brain research and physiological factors related to alcohol and drug use, co-occurring issues, substance abuse dependence and abuse, prevalence rates, you know, how prevalent is substance abuse with adolescents, as well as any other psychosocial factors. And then I'm just going to give you an update on kind of the adolescent substance abuse treatment field. Um, it's kind of been defined as a renaissance, so we're going to talk about what that renaissance has taught us or what we're seeing. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the emerging issues based on policy and research, as well as some recommendations for everyone in the room, perhaps for your own work or your own studies. And then I'm going to make a shout out for some investigators. Okay? Ooh, let's go in the right direction here. Okay. So human hardware. There's a, a, a psychiatrist by the name of uh, Sandra Bloom. She is actually in um, New York, and she is the director of what is called the Sanctuary Institute. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. But she's done a lot of work in relationship to trauma and our, our systems, our uh, places in which we work. We provide services, our residential treatment programs, our psychiatric hospitals, and those types of things. And one of the things that she uh, categorizes is she has human hardware and human software. And the human hardware is really the things that we're born with, our DNA, proteins, cells, organs, brain, body, those types of things. That's, that's, that's the human hardware. 
So what's really the human software? Well, in, a, in an operating system, if you're using Windows, you have your Windows platform. If you're using Mac, you have your OS platforms. Um, those are your operating systems for uh, computers. But with people, um, really the operating system, your foundation is really a, a, an element of attachment. And attachment is, do you have relationships with adults or people or caring individuals? Are you attached to folks? That's really your foundation. Um, and, and from that foundation, your applications per, perhaps work at their best. And your applications are your memory, your language, your voluntary movements, and those types of things. Now, oftentimes, when you, your computer, if you, you know, maybe download something that you didn't really mean to or those kinds of things, you can get a virus. And so what Sandra Bloom uh, often said is that a virus in a human actually can be trauma. And that trauma can really mess up the operating system. And traumas can be associated with um, abuse, neglect, witnessing violence, um, those types of things. So when I talk about illicit drug use, illicit drug use is really uh, the, using a substance that's illegal. Okay, so when we think about teenagers, we don't often think that tobacco is illegal and because you have to be 18. And for individuals under the age of 21, um, alcohol is also illegal. So when I talk about illicit drug use, those are the types of things that I'm talking about. Now, I won't go into too much uh, on this because I'm sure you're all very familiar with the DSM. Four dash R, um, and this is substance dependence. Okay, so making a diagnosis for sub substance dependence is really about meeting um, three or more of the following within a, a 12 month period. So we're looking at tolerance, withdrawal, substance taken in larger amounts or for longer than you meant to, persistent or unsuccessful desire to cut down or control use. Um, spends a lot of time either getting or taking substances. Um, import, you give up important social or occupational things, um, as well as keep using even though you know it's causing you problems. Um, the main thing with this that I, I always like to tell folks is that um, when we look at our, our kids coming into residential substance abuse treatment, 80% meet criteria for dependence with physiological effects. So these are kids that are really kind of um, in serious trouble. So then when we look at abuse, the main difference between abuse and dependence is, is the absence of tolerance and those types of things. This is more of patterns of behavior, such as failure to fill, fill roles, physically hazard, you know, get in situations that physically hazardous, drink and drive, a um, lot of legal problems. Maybe they got ditched school or perhaps they um, got caught um, uh, smoking a joint or something like that. Um, and then they also have continued, they continue use even if um, they get, get in trouble. And also one thing to keep in mind is that when we look at the DSM, many of the criteria are built for adults. They're built for um, individuals 18 plus. And, and when we look at patterns of substance abuse for kids, their patterns don't necessarily meet the, the same types of uh, they don't do the, they don't use in the same way that adults do. Um, for example, many kids will binge drink um, or they're opportunistic users. So they are at a party and then they, they use and they may be used to excess. Um, so these patterns of abuse and dependence are not necessarily the same as adults. So when we look at recovery, what does recovery mean? And um, the field is really kind of in, in somewhat of a turmoil about what is recovery. Oftentimes, I mean, if we look at the history of substance abuse treatment over the, even in the 80s, we looked at, you know, just say no. M many times, um, substance abuse is uh, classified as a willful vice or something you can just give up. It's not that big a deal. But the more we learn about how it actually impacts our brains, the more we know that it is a kind of reoccurring, chronic, relapsing condition. Um, and so when we talk about recovery, recovery, there's a lot of things um, that go into recovery. And so the most recent definition is an, the experience, a process, and a sustained status through which individuals, families, and communities impacted by severe alcohol and other drug use use re 
use related problems mobilize internal and external resources too. It's quite the mouthful. <laughs> I'm trying to incorporate everything into the definition of recovery. But to voluntarily resolve these problems, heal the wounds inflicted by these problems, and actively manage their continued vulnerable, vulnerability to such problems and develop a healthy, productive, and meaningful life. Okay, so again, when we look at recovery, it's more of a process rather than something that just is, you, you get. It's a journey through which it may take a few relapses. Um, in fact, I'll show you some data in just a minute that it may take several relapses before you have sustained recovery. Okay, so let's, let's put all these definitions to work. I'm not going to go into a lot of this information, but um, we are learning through the National Institute on Drug Abuse, we're really learning about the, the development of the brain and, and then how that drug use actually impacts the development of the brain. We know that um, the latest research is showing that um, the brain actually develops from the outside forward. Okay, you guys probably all know this. Um, and so when we look at adolescents, um, their ability to make sound judgments and those types of things isn't quite fully developed. Um, and the reward system um, is one of the mo more active parts of the brain. And we know that substance individuals that use substances, um, every single study has shown that there's a, uh, if you smoke, uh, marijuana, if you drink alcohol, if you use cocaine, it all has a major effect on the reward system and, and by releasing a whole bunch of dopamine to the brain. Okay, so what they found is that, you know, this really impacts a, an individual's ability to just say no or quit drugs because it, the brain is saying this is, this is a very pleasurable thing. I like this. Okay, so this is actually something that you can show to kids. This is actually a cartoon, um, but it's basically showing gray matter over time. And, we, and on this end, it's age five, and at the very other end is age 20. Um, obviously, gray matter is not blue, <laughs> as characterized in this, but, um, and actually, it's actually the red is the gray matter. The red and the yellow is the gray matter. And we can see that actually adolescents, teens, young people have a lot of gray matter. Unfortunately, it's not quite as protected. Um, the protection of this gray matter actually occurs in the, in, at age 20 through um, myelination. Okay? And, and that actually helps protect it. Okay? Am I confusing people? I'm seeing some confusing faces. Okay, so that's really what that shows is that they, it, over time the, the brain is, is, full, is developing well into somebody's 20s. Okay, so then what we look at um, um, PET scans after using cocaine. So this is the first, the first row is an actual normal brain that's not used any cocaine. Um, the second line is the cocaine abuser after 10 days of abstinence. This is after no use, after 10 days. And then at the, the third row is actually a cocaine abuser after 100 days. So what we can see is that the actual brain activity, even after times of abstinence, takes some time to recover. It's not fully um, back to its normal self. It takes time. It does recover, but it takes time. So then, why is this important for adolescents? Um, we know that most folks, when we look at the uh, age of onset for substance abuse, it's usually about 15 to 16 years old. Um, if you look, I think it's about 95% of adult substance users started before the age of 18. So the age of onset is very young. And then as time goes on, the, the rates decrease um, for a couple of reasons. One is people um, go into remission or they get arrested or they, you know, die, pass away. Um, and so that's why some of the, the rates go down. But really the main, the main focus of the age groups is early, early teens is when the onset of substance abuse happens. And we know that men and women metabolize um, uh, drugs and alcohol much differently. Um, we know that women have a higher fat to water ratio, um, have reduced liver body weight ratio, 
Um, they have fewer stomach enzymes to break down the alcohol and drugs. What we find with adolescent girls coming into substance abuse treatment, their, um, their, uh, you, their rate, their, oh, sorry, their, their use is um, much more severe than their male counterparts and much earlier. Their progression to addiction is much faster than for boys. Um, the, also, the menstrual cycle has an impact on drug use. We found with women, um, active using women in, on the south side of Tucson, we found that actually women found um, drug use much more pleasurable before ovulation and then found a lot more um, uh, um, cravings after ovulation. So they craved it more after ovulation but preferred it, found it more pre pleasurable before ovulation. Um, also, we know that women suffer from much more severe brain damage and likely to disease, develop diseases as lung cancer uh, much more quickly than male, their male counterparts. So we know that, that on average there's about 10 million people in this country that have a combination of both um, some type of mental health disorder as well as a substance abuse disorder. Um, some studies done um, have found that at least 63% of adolescents entering a public funded uh, substance abuse treatment had at least one mental health diagnosis and 55% entering privately funded. Okay, so this is, this is really important because what it's, most of our substance abuse treatment programs, particularly in the publicly funded uh, sector, don't have the capacity to be able to provide treatment to kids that need, have a co-occurring dis disorder. Um, so, and then we, 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 well, I'm really stuttering today. Excuse me. Uh, my mixed, there's really mixed results in terms of gender. Some studies have found that um, uh, girls have many more uh, co-occurring disorders, such as trauma, depression, and those types of things. But other studies have found no differences in terms of gender. So the results are very mixed. Um, because there isn't kind of standardized assessment for trauma, the, the, the rates vary for substance abuse treatment. So it could be anywhere from 40 to 90 percent of adolescents entering substance abuse treatment have been victimized or, or have trauma. Um, and what we found is that uh, there's a history of victimization has been associated with um, higher problem recognition. They don't realize that they have a substance abuse problem or any other types of problems. They're hard, it's harder for them to recognize that. They're much more likely to be substance use dependent. Um, they also have co-occurring psychiatric conditions as well as they have many more negative peer and family influences. Um, and these trauma sy symptoms have also been related to physical health issues such as stomach problems or those types of things. Um, risky sexual behaviors, not using condoms during uh, sexual intercourse, um, as well as sleep problems, not being able to uh, fall asleep on time, being fearful to go to sleep, and those types of things. So when we look at the prevalence rates across the country, you can see um, Arizona is one of the higher states in terms of substance abuse prevalence. The, the burgundy is kind of the worst rate um, and the red and the light red are kind of the next. So it's, Arizona has a prevalence rate of about 10 to 11 percent of people that have a substance abuse, depend, have substance abuse or dependence. Um, if we look at Pinal County, um, that's the county perhaps with the worst substance use um, and dependence rates. Um, now, I did talk about uh, illicit drug use, um, but there is an emerging amount of uh, literature that's showing a lot of uh, prescription drug use abuse. Um, kind of, it's kind of been uh, touted the Generation RX. Um, and these are, we know that about one in five teens report abusing prescription drugs at least once. One in 10, 10% 10 reported abusing prescription pain relievers like Oxycontin. One in 11 teens has tried uh, the prescription Ritalin or Adderall without a prescription. So they get it from their friends at school or those types of things. Um, and when we look at other types of drug use, such as ecstasy, cocaine, LSD, over-the-counter medication, um, 
equals or exceeds these numbers of use. So this, this is really, um, there's been a call to action to look at uh, prescription drug abuse. Now, NIDA did, surveyed some of uh, the medical profession and wanted to find out, okay, so where are these prescription drug use coming from? Anybody have an idea of where they might be coming from? Parents, Parents okay. Dentists. They found that dentists were the number one prescriber of um, these types of medications to children, and then they were being um, abused. So again, it's not somebody would, a profession that we would have normally thought of, um, but certainly uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse is trying to engage dentists to uh, provide them with some more protocols on how, how to identify substance abuse in this with teens. So we know that there's a problem, and we know that there's treatment, but when we look at the rates of people really accessing treatment, um, nationally there's about 2.1 million adolescents that meet dependence and abuse criteria um, for um, substance abuse, yet only about 181,000 actually get it. So it's only about 9%. Well, when we ask people, why don't you go into treatment, um, the number one reason, 94%, is they don't think they need it. Um, there's a variety of reasons associated with that. If they're keeping it in check, there's a lot of stigma associated with substance abuse um, and those types of things. Um, treatment's not really effective. I'm getting to school, um, those kinds of things. But for the most part, 90, pe most people don't think they need substance abuse treatment. But if they do try to seek it, and then don't get it, what were the factors associated with that? Well, the number one reason is cost or insurance barriers. It's either too expensive, their insurance doesn't cover it, um, they're not sure how to get connected with the various networks. Um, there's also other access barriers. Maybe there's not a treatment program within their locality, those types of things. Um, and then not ready to stop using or s stigma associated with substance abuse. So, um, as I mentioned, when, when it's, uh, substance abuse is really a relapsing chronic condition, and when we look at the data, um, this is the years from first treatment to one, one year or more of abstinence. And really what we found was that it takes generally three to four treatment episodes over a period of nine years. Okay, so oftentimes funders or families, they want things to be fixed quickly. We want to send them to treatment, get them better, and then everything's going to be fine. When in reality, that's not always the, con the way that it works. And, and the data shows that it's going to take several treatment episodes, and it's going to take a long time. But once, if they stick with it, very similar to cigarette smoking. We learned that with cigarette smoking. You know, it takes multiple times to try to quit. Same with drugs and alcohol particularly if that brain is so, so rewarded with the drugs and alcohol. So we know also that um, for dependence and abuse, if, if kids meet um, dependence and abuse criteria, they're much more likely to have lots of other problems. It's not just the drugs and the alcohol. We know that they're having problems with their uh, parents, we know that they don't like school very much. They're not succeeding in school. They might be getting D's or lower. Um, they also have major depression, and they are also involved with mental health treatment. If we look at these two bars, the, the dark brown and the red, those are your de dependence and abuse kids. Um, so we know that it, it really impacts multiple areas of their life. So I always like to put some na a name to the data because um, that's always important. And this is actually a young woman that we do know that's in one of our projects. This is not her real name. Um, but this is Marilyn, and she's a 16-year-old Latina. She was sent to residential treatment by juvenile justice. She was mandated to treatment, which about 80% of our kids that come into residential treatment are there because of juvenile justice involvement. Um, she's primarily used marijuana, alcohol, and cocaine. Her mother was murdered, and her father is absent. absent. She's not sure where her father is. Um, she has five siblings and after her mother was murdered they were all separated um, and she but she is connected to one of her brothers um, who she's act they're living with her brother's father's stepmother's home and she calls this woman grandma. Um, Marilyn actually was successful with residential substance abuse treatment. She completed it. She did really well. Within about 30 days she became pregnant 
and now she's pregnant and trying, struggling to complete um, high school. She's really struggling. The, the side effects from the pregnancy, the nausea and those types of things are really making getting to school difficult. Um, but she's, she's still clean. She's not using drugs. Obviously, there, she's still working. She's trying to, she's in recovery and she's really trying to do some things um, in her life, but these are, the, these are the kinds of stories that we see throughout um, substance abuse treatment. Okay, so it's been de defined as a renaissance of adolescent treatment, and I'll tell you why um, it's been defined that. Uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, um, it's called the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. It, they started funding a series of initiatives for, um, to replicate substance abuse treatment using evidence-based practice and evidence-based assessment. Um, over the past 10 years, they've probably funded more than 300 grants across the country. Now, the one thing with this is that each grant was mandated to use uh, an assessment. The assessment is called the Global Appraisal of Individual Needs. It's called the GAIN. It's a biopsychosocial assessment um, that can be used for treatment planning and di actually treatment diagnosis planning and recommendations. It can also be used for research and evaluation purposes. Um, so what, since then, what we found is this is actually a little old. This is from the... 2007 data set. We do have a 2008 data set now, but from that we have about 15,254 cases that we can now look at across the country of adolescents coming into substance abuse treatment. Um, those programs are primarily filled with um, males. Uh, only about 27 percent are actually female, and we know that the primary reason for this is that, 80 as mentioned, 80 percent of kids that get to treatment are there through the juvenile justice system. Girls are not as likely to show up in the juvenile justice system as boys. So we know that that's, that's probably the primary reason for the, the low percentage of females. There's also a very low percentage of African Americans in um, treatment. Uh, almost 42 percent are, are white. Um, so we know that it's really white males that are in our adolescent substance abuse treatment programs um, between the ages of 15 and 17. Um, primarily, uh, substance abuse treatment is in, provided in outpatient settings, not residential. If you look in just uh, Pima County, the only, I'm fairly certain the only publicly funded residential treatment program is the Arizona Children's Association. Now there are other residential treatment programs, um, but they're not publicly funded. They're mostly um, private pay. Um, and then there's intensive outpatient, which is very small. And outpatient is classified as typically about one, one to seven hours per week. And in, intensive outpatient is nine hours or more per week. Um, and then if we look at residential, if there is residential, it's about 17% um, and it's long-term, long-term meaning anything over 30 days. So we've also started looking at systems of care approaches. So trying to break down some of the barriers between the various systems that interact with adolescents. We know that um, adolescents particularly are um, affiliated with multiple systems. They might juvenile justice, there might be the child welfare involvement, there might be school and education. So what we're really trying to do is figure out ways to work together on the, at the benefit of the youth and the family. Um, so, but unfortunately, there's a, uh, in terms of applying this, it's really youth and family centered, really letting the youth and the family decide what their treatment might be, what it might entail. Um, also, coordinating services, information sharing, and um, including those diverse professions. Um, but it also means that we have to examine our own systems to make sure that they're really healthy to provide the best services for kids and families. And we're also seeing a recovery-oriented care approach versus um, this is the shift from the acute care um, to the recovery-oriented. So planning, so to speak, for relapse and then what to happens with that and how to uh, rehook up with kids and get them back into treatment, back into services. Um, we really want to shift from a problem to a solution focus. 
Um, we want to move from viewing relapse as a treatment or an individual failure, but rather a pathway for someone to recover. They may have to go through this relapse in order to learn and grow. Um, treatment programs working with indigenous recovery support groups, working with communities, um, working with um, various uh, organizations within somebody's neighborhood or kind of fam elders in communities, really identifying positive role models. Um, and then also really putting a lot of emphasis on the recovery environment. What does that look like? And then also helping uh, individuals develop recovery capital. So developing their positive assets and, and internal and external assets that can help them throughout their process. So when we look at organizational stress and trauma, we know that our organ, especially in the behavioral health world, organizations are stressed. Um, there's lots of changes in funding, particularly recently, there's lots of changes in funding. And then there also with rules and regulations, we get more paperwork and more things to fill out and people to uh, account to. Um, there's also increased regulations, what you can and cannot share, um, increased surveillance, people coming in and checking. Um, as well as lots of program cuts. All of these, these issues were designed really as a, a way to protect the people that are in substance abuse treatment. Unfortunately, that has kind of shifted from a punitive model to almost uh, counselors and administrators are just responding to these issues a lot of the time rather than actually doing the work that they need to do. Um, uh, uh, Sandra Bloom also talks about parallel processes in organizations. So you have clients and youth, you have your staff, and then you have organizations. So if clients and youth feel unsafe and staff feel unsafe, then the perception of the organization is that it is unsafe. Um, if clients are angry and aggressive and staff respond with anger, anger and aggression, then organizations start to ma mandate punitive measures. They start punishing people. Um, if the youth feel helpless and the staff feel helpless, then the organization gets stuck. There's nothing we can do. Well, it's just the way it is. If there's hopeless clients and hopeless staff, and then the organization almost becomes missionless. Um, similarly, if we know kids that are, particularly if they're traumatized, they might be hyperaroused, but if staff meet hyperarousal with hyperarousal, then the organization almost becomes crisis driven. Um, rather than uh, proactive and safe. Um, if the clients are confused and the staff are confused, then there's very, very, very little values. So this, this parallel process of the clients and the children and the staff and then how the organizations respond, there's a lot of things that go on, particularly in residential treatment settings. So this sometimes hap the probably the biggest uh, factor related to this is that it um, is related to stress communications. The first thing that people do when they're stressed or organizations, they have a lot to do, the first thing they do is get rid of meetings. Oh, we're gonna cancel that meeting. Which in reality, that's probably the most important thing is to keep those meetings, keep the communication flowing. Um, and then we have perception narrow. So if you're canceling meetings, you're not getting a whole bunch of different perceptions on what's going on, so those narrow. So the people in charge are making decisions based on very small perceptions, maybe their own or one or two people that they rely on. Um, the contextual information is lost. Not sure why did this happen? What were the precipitating factors? What is going on? Let's talk about the context of this particular instance. Um, you get a lot more one-way, top-down communications. Okay, we got a new form from the state and everybody must use 12-point uh, times New Roman font and I don't want to hear anything about it, just do it. So it's more of that top-down uh, communication methods. And there's not a lot of time for feedback. You're not a, there's not a lot of opportunity to provide feedback on what's going on. You, let, you lose democracy and complexity. So the, the issues that, um, particularly in substance abuse treatment, these issues are complex. We're looking at trauma and other co-occurring issues and substance abuse and family and school and lots of things. So we have to always remember that the individual is, is very complex and we should not minimize it to uh, just something that they just need to do. They just need to get over it or those kinds of things. Um, also, you start having that learned helplessness in organizations and staff feel uh, disempowered. 
So if we're really going to want to make a renaissance, we have to examine our own systems to make sure that they're healthy enough for the people that we're working with. Because for sure, everybody in this room and everybody out in the field providing treatment really want to do, do right by people. We want to help people. That's our intention. We don't want to um, uh, hurt them in any way. Unfortunately, sometimes the systems uh, don't always make it, allow for us making the most healthy decisions. So let me tell you about our new project. It's called the Las Rosas Program, and it was funded by SAMHSA, uh, the S Center for S uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. It's a collaboration with CIRO and Arizona Children's Association. This is uh, where, because we have such a small percentage of girls in substance abuse treatment, we're really trying, we're targeting girls only. And we're trying to identify where girls are, are in need, how do we get them into the residential substance abuse treatment, and those types of things. So we're targeting 120 girls over three years. Um, it may seem like a small sample, but it's an enormous task undertaking. If we actually achieve that, I'll be jumping for joy. Um, and we're implementing three evidence-based models. One is the sanctuary model. So we're working with Arizona Children's Association to implement um, systems change within their own organization to provide a safe, uh, trauma-informed center. Um, we're also uh, implementing uh, Seeking Safety, which is a present-focused trauma and substance abuse treatment model. It's a uh, very cognitive behavioral type model uh, addressing both substance abuse and trauma. And then we're also implementing our own uh, sexual health education, um, which we call Zero She. And then we're activating a recovery-oriented systems of care consortium um, that is really designed to help reduce barriers. We've uh, incorporated uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Harrison, Harrison Monroe and Dr. Wall are on our uh, consortium. And it's the, the idea is really to reduce barriers uh, to treatment. So if we have a young person that gets out of substance abuse treatment, and they're having some problems with education. We, we have somebody from the county su superintendent's office that can help us eliminate the barriers for schooling. We're really trying to incorporate as many different disciplines so that all of our systems can get at one table, talk, and help reduce barriers for these young women. And then as a result of this, we're going to write a, a brief to make some policy recommendations of ways that we can improve our substance abuse treatment systems. So as, as mentioned, it's the, uh, recovery is a kind of a process rather than an event. And when um, we look at our model, we're looking at um, it's much more circular rather than linear. And it, it includes uh, services and supports, recovery, health, and wellness. We're offering family services, residential services. Um, rather than relapse prevention, which we think is, has somewhat of a negative com connotation, we're talking recovery support plans, we're trying to flip some of the negative language into positive language, um, empowerment services, adolescent care, health care, um, sexual health and HIV testing services. We're also offering pre-treatment assessment. We're trying to identify only those girls that are in need of residential treatment. Um, it's oftentimes, uh, girls or youth will be uh, sent to residential treatment. Um, they don't necessarily need to be at that level of care, but they need some, you know, the state or someone needs to place them somewhere, so residential treatment will get them, and, but it's not necessarily the best place for them. So we're trying to really do some pre-treatment assessment to make sure that the girls coming into residential treatment meet criteria for that level of care. Um, we're also offering physical and psychiatric health care um, with the support of the university here. Um, we also are um, implementing lots of trauma-informed treatment. So then the main thing for young people is once they're in residential treatment, then they have to go back to the community. They have to go back to their same neighborhoods, their same families, their, same, their own systems. Um, so what we've done is we've hired a recovery support specialist, and her job is to link up with kids, these girls, within seven days of leaving residential treatment. She actually meets them while they're in residential treatment, but the idea is to 
partner, become a recovery coach, if you will. Um, help them get into school, help them get into um, some pro-social activity, um, help them get to continuing care services, uh, cheer them on because they're you know, 30 or 60 days clean, those types of things. Um, so that's really her job. We're also using the element of technology. Um, this is a digital, the, our, our teens are just as hooked up to the internet and MySpace and Facebook and all that other stuff as m other kids. And so what we've done is we've created uh, podcasts that kids can download that uh, address issues such as uh, how to effectively communicate, problem solving, those types of things. Um, and then just general case management services. Okay. So where are we going here? So when we look at um, data, um, there's very little efficacy data among adolescents with uh, substance abuse disorders. And what, what this means is um, we don't have very many studies that examine um, kids that um, are also being treated for conduct disorder or depression and substance abuse. There's not much there. We need many more studies. We need more investigators to get excited about the subject and uh, write for grants and conduct studies. Unfortunately, there, or unfortunately or fortunately, there are some issues with uh, informed consent and the ethical issues related to studies with kids. Um, however, the, our institutional review board is actually really good about kind of looking at the the issues related to ethical and legal issues surrounding so as and you can you can get you can educate and get an informed consent um, some of the other recommendations are to integrate both treatments so get your psychiatric help as well as substance abuse treatment either concurrently or you know uh, sequentially either one just get kids the help that they need um, assess for safety, suicide risk, risk of overdose, and activation. Consider abuse potential of certain medications. I, um, the, one of the handouts over here is a list of drugs, uh, over-the-counter drugs that can be abused. Um, and then also, whenever possible, combine psychotropic medication with empirically based psychosocial substance use dependence treatment. So motivational enhancement therapy has been proven uh, effective, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, the adolescent community reinforcement approach, ACRA, or, and the assertive continuing care. These are all behavioral um, based uh, interventions that have been proven effective. And we know that there are some changes in healthcare. Um, we know that uh, with the new administration, we're going to see lots of changes in health care. We're going to probably see the substance abuse treatment field move into much more specialization. Um, by that means, you know, residential treatment should be specialized for those types of kids that need that level of care. Outpatient treatment should be specialized to not just in take every kid that gets referred from the juvenile justice, but perhaps be, um, uh, it, it should fit the kid the their, their needs. Um, also, outcomes. The, we're, people are going to be looking for data. Are you getting any kind of pros, positive uh, changes? And we look at uh, adolescent substance abuse treatment, we do see reductions in substance abuse over time. Um, study after study shows that it's effective. We see reduce, reductions over time. We don't necessarily see abstinence, but we never see uh, kids go back to where they came from at baseline. They never go higher than um, baseline. It, it's definitely, there's, they're having changes over time. Um, and then also we're going to look at cost effectiveness. Um, what are the best outcomes that are least expensive? Um, those are some things that I think are, are emerging trends. Okay, so here's our call out or shout out. Um, the National Institute on Drug Abuse um, actually examined the prof professional disciplines of its science, scientists. Child and adolescent psychiatrists were the least represented in the field. So if you have any interest at all in substance abuse, I highly encourage you 
to think about writing an R01, getting, um, there's also fellowship programs, those types of things. I have names and numbers that I could hook you up with. So if you have any interest, please, I r highly encourage you to do that. We definitely need many more people, particularly in child and adolescent psychiatry, to get excited about addiction research. Um, so what's the take home message? Uh, uh, Adolescent, ad, addressing adolescent substance abuse is a complex challenge which requires multidisciplinary approaches and coordinated systems of care. Uh, the renaissance of adolescent treatment has proven treatment effectiveness and areas for improvement, including examining our own systems to make sure that they're healthy for the people that we work with. And the addiction field holds exciting promise um, based on science and things that we're learning. Um, and to implement innovative programs and test those interventions. Um, so with that, I, um, I, of course, I need to acknowledge lots of people and dis make a disclaimer that this uh, presentation was funded in part by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, through a grant, the views expressed here are the authors and do not necessarily represent the funding uh, policies of the Department of Health and Human Services. And I need to acknowledge all the staff at CIRO that work so hard to collect data and work with the youth and families in our communities, as well as every single uh, family that's kind of engaged in the process of recovery. I think that their commitment is awesome. So with that, I will open it up for questions or comments.